welcome everyone. Welcome to our webinar on the COP15 outcomes for businesses, uh, and which will be focused on bio biodiversity trajectory reporting and biodiversity credits. So we will start shortly in a few minutes uh, before everyone can join us. Uh, we invite you to go first on Mentimeter, which is a platform we will use during the webinar to, um, for you to ask your questions so that we could answer during the webinar. So your uh, mics will be off during the webinar. So really please use this platform for all your questions. Um, so you have the QR code uh, and the link uh, on the slides. We will send you also the link through the chat. You can enter the code uh, here. And while I will I let you connect on Mentimeter, I will show, I, I will invite you to answer actually to our first question um, about uh, to know you a, a, a bit better. Um, so you can tell us uh, from which company are you from? Which company do you represent? So this question should appear on your screen. Sorry for the technical issues. So the, the question should appear on your screen and I will let you uh, answer a little moment to answer to this question. So um, I'm Patricia Jang and I'm the development and methodology lead in the global biodiversity, sorry, biodiversity score team. Uh, and uh, we will present this webinar with uh, some invited speakers from business, uh, sorry, from um, Business for, for Nature and Nature Finance, and also some experts uh, in our team. Um, so, yeah, so do, during the webinar, your mics will be on mute and your video, uh, your camera will be off. We invite you to use Mentimeter to ask your questions. Uh, also on Zoom, please rename yourself uh, with your name and uh, your uh, company or entity you represent. And also after the webinar, do not forget to register on the Eventbrite event to be sure to receive the slides after the webinar. So for the agenda, um, so today uh, we will first talk about the general by um, COP15 um, outcomes for businesses, especially uh, around the reporting framework linked to target 15. And we have the pleasure to talk about this topic with Michael uh, Ofosu and advisor from Business for Nature. After that, uh, we will talk about biodiversity trajectories for businesses um, interpreted from the GBF outcomes. Uh, and we will talk about this with Sibyl, uh, our footprint uh, expert in CDC biodiversity. And at the end, we will talk about the biodiversity credits and how to build on them, uh, as mentioned in the target 19 in the biodiversity, in the global biodiversity framework with uh, Simon Zedek from Nature Finance. And finally, we will talk about the B4B plus biodiversity credit groups with Elisa Mager. Um, our project officer uh, on the Before B Plus Club in the team. And we will have some time for questions and answers uh, to answer your questions from Mentimeter at the end of the webinar. So, um, okay. So without, without further ado, I will let Michael uh, present uh, some uh, insights on the COP15 outcomes and related to the reporting framework. Excellent. Thank you very much, Patricia. Um, it's a real pleasure to be speaking to your community here today. Like you said, my name is Michael Ophusikino Wise, and I am the Senior Manager for Business Action for the Business for Nature Coalition which is a coalition of business and conservation organizations working together to really drive business action 
and policy ambition in, to deliver a nature positive future for all by 2030. I'm sure by this point, many of you would have already heard about um, the COP15 summit, which took place in Montreal at the end of last year, and the very um, momentous outcome that came out being the global biodiversity framework. So today, my objective is really to give you a high level overview of what was achieved and the implication for businesses, particularly within the EU context. So just to start, um, I think to set the scene, we all know that the UN um, CBD progress, for those that are also familiar with the climate process, is like a sister conference to the UNFCCC. And this year, the objective for the conference at COP15 was really to land a new plan to address the nature crisis by 2030. At the conference, we saw unprecedented representation from the business community, as well as other civil society um, stakeholders, which they really collectively helped land what is now known as the Kunming Montreal Post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, um, which has now become the foundation and the long-term strategy for how we tackle um, nature loss, how we halt and reverse nature loss by 2030. So on to the next slide, just to give you a bit of the structure of what this framework looks like. At the top is a 2050 vision, which looks at where we want to be by 2050, and that is to live in harmony with nature. Underpinned by four strong goals to deliver this mission. We have the first goal, which is a nature conservation, of course, to conserve um, nature, biodiversity, and all elements within it. We also have the ecosystem services preservation, which is looking at all the services that nature and ecosystems provide for us as humanity. The third piece is around access and benefit sharing, how we equitably share the access and benefits that nature provides to all of us. And lastly, the fourth goal is around financing and the means of implementation. So the Global Biodiversity Framework, as many of you would have heard, um, has a 2030 mission, which is very clear. And I think those of us working in the nature positive community were really happy with the outcome of the discussions around the mission, which is now to halt and reverse biodiversity laws by 2030. So what we want to do is that is first to stop and halting the negative impact that we're having on nature and starting rapidly to reverse the loss that is already happening. The 2030 mission is supported by 23 targets for 2030. And um, these 23 targets can be categorized in three broad areas, particularly around reducing threats sustainable use and benefit sharing, and also implementation and mainstreaming. And if you go on to the next slide, I'll be able to give you a bit more of an insight into how these 23 targets are distributed amongst those three um, priority areas. And here, what we wanted to quickly show is some of the key targets that are relevant for business. And that's not to say that all of the framework and the supporting uh, outcomes at COP15 are not relevant for business because the entire framework is relevant for business. But for example, on target three conservation, where we're talking about 30% of the planet effectively conserved and managed by 2030, we have pollution targets where the idea is to reduce excess nutrients by 50% and reduction of overall risk um, from pesticides and chemicals. We also have target eight, which looks at the nexus between climate and nature. And we know that climate change and nature loss are two sides of the same coin, inextricably linked, and businesses will have to take action to address both. We have target nine on the sustainable use, target 10 on agriculture, access and benefit sharing for target 18, 13, which is really integral to how we share the resources of nature. Um, and then of course, on the implementation and mainstream streaming section, there are also very key targets such as 14, which is the mainstreaming. Target 15, of course, being the one that we will talk about into more depth today because it's the target 
that talks about the role of business in delivering the, the mission, as well as target 16, consumption, then we have subsidies and finance. I wouldn't be able to go into all of these details today, but if we go into the next slide, we're able to start honing down into some of the key ones that I'll be focusing on today. So from a business for nature perspective, we really prioritize three main issues going into COP. The first one is around the mission um, and the outcome that we receive being language which explicitly says we need to halt and reverse biodiversity loss by 2030, we see as a really big win uh, because this, to a certain extent, gives the global goal for where we need to be and is also defined the objective for business to online their strategy. So companies now understand what the 2030 mission is and they're starting to think about how to align their strategies and their long-term plans with this overarching mission. The second priority for Business for Nature was also on target 15, which is around the role that business has to play within this whole architecture. We know that the role of business will be critical and the messaging that we had going in there was calling for governments to make it mandatory for large corporations um, to assess and disclose their impact and dependencies on nature. And we're quite positive with the results that we received, which is around government claiming or you know, agreeing to ensure, including through requirements that all large and financial um, institutions will now access and disclose their impact and dependence on nature. This is a clear signal that business will be required to take these actions. And it also gives a little bit of the mandate for companies and organizations within this ecosystem to really start harmonizing and standardizing some of the approaches for assessment and disclosure. The third piece is around subsidies. So removing environmentally harmful subsidies. And again, um, the language that was secured in COP15 was to eliminate, phase out, or reform harmful subsidies, which we think is in the right direction, but also we were able to have a measurable target. I think this was one of the few targets that has a measurable target of at least $500 billion per year by 2030. And that provides a baseline by which progress can be measured again. There are other targets, like I mentioned, target seven, target 10, no, 13 consumption and non-finance, which other organizations were also prioritizing. And collectively as the business um, stakeholder group, we were able to secure relatively positive outcomes on these targets. So to start transitioning and concluding on my uh, presentation, I would like to hold in then on target 15, what it means and the implications for, for business. So if we go into the next slide, like I mentioned, target 15 is really the target that talks about the role businesses and financial institutions will have to play to support the delivery of the global biodiversity framework. And the language that we secured was that governments will require all large and financial, all large businesses and financial institutions to assess and disclose their risks and impact and the dependencies on nature through their operations, but also their supply and value chains and portfolios. So that means all large companies will be required to take this action, but we know that the language around operations, supply chain and value chain means SMEs will be expected to also support the large organization with the information with the data, and that will in, in effect will trickle down to some of the small and medium sized enterprises in terms of taking action. So just to break the, the target down into what is actually expected of business and what businesses should be getting ready for in the next couple of years. The first one is really to comply with the monitoring and assessment, as well as the disclosure requirements. We now know that large companies will be asked to do that. Um, this will also need to address the double materiality, um, not only looking at the, the financial implications of disclosure, but also 
the implications for wider society. So this is not only for businesses to understand the financial implications of their impact and dependency, but to think beyond that and address implications for environment, for nature, and for people as well. The second action, which is also explicit in Target 15, is that companies will be ex expected to provide sustainability and information to consumers. So they can already start to expect stronger regulations to disclose information or nature impact to consumers and to inform them in making stronger and more informed choices. And then, of course, the final action on this piece is that they will be required to report and on compliance with access and benefit sharing. Um, there's a lot of regulation that is being discussed and particularly related to target, 50, target 13 um, of, the, of the GBF, which is specifically on access and benefit sharing. And the objective of this target is really for companies then to have an overall reduction of negative impacts and start to slowly increase their positive impacts on nature to support the whole thing and reversing of biodiversity laws by 2030. So hopefully that's all clear on what the target is and the implications for business, the specific actions that companies will be expected to take. So what's next? And if we go to the last slide, we know that businesses and governments are like are switching rapidly towards implementation. On the government side, um, we're expecting, you know, the development of NBSAP, also known as the National Biodiversity uh, Action Strategy. Um, and some governments, and on this front, I think the EU is already well positioned to, you know, lead the charge. So what we need to do now is start to build on existing government regulations. From an EU perspective, we know that there's the uh, SFDR, the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, which is starting to look at how companies will disclose. Some countries are already leading. So for example, the French regulation on disclosure is something that um, was recently developed. And we have other, other countries such as Switzerland um, and others looking very closely at how to position disclosure regulation in light of the global biodiversity framework. We also have new you know, EU CSRD uh, mechanisms being developed and companies as well as governments are looking at how to make sure that this is aligned with uh, the global biodiversity framework. On the corporate side, there are also a lot of existing frameworks for business to already start taking action, such as the science-based targets network, also known as SBTN, for those that are more familiar with this space. Um, SBTN are working with companies on science-based approaches to, to start setting very credible targets on nature. The Natural Capital Protocol is a protocol that was developed a few years ago to help companies with assessment of natural capital, so assessing the impact and dependency of natural capital on their work. The TNFD is also very rapidly working on how companies can start to disclose risk and dependencies on nature. CDP have a very long-standing voluntary disclosure system, which tried and tested um, with you know, carbon and climate change reporting, and they're increasingly also ramping up for, for nature. Similarly, we have the GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative, and the Global Common Alliance as well, um, that are working with all of these organizations to ensure accountability of um, companies taking action. So there are a lot of initiatives that are already there for companies to, to take action. And I think the next step is to start to accelerate the standardization and um, sort of harmonizing all of these initiatives. So of course, from Business for Nature side, uh, we started working on high level business actions, I'm sure, those that are engaged in this space sort of ahead of the act D high level actions for companies to assess, commit, transform, and disclose. This is a high level entry framing for companies that are just starting their journey. Um, it's been aligned with many of the initiatives that I talked about earlier as well. We're now also starting to work on sector specific actions that help companies that are more advanced that want to look at how they can 
take action within their specific se sectors. And then of course, on the disclosure front, we're looking at the ISSB working together with many of these disclosure platforms to bring all of them together in a way that can help globalization and standardization of the reporting. And then of course, for the EU context, we have a European financial reporting standard as well. So we have the global biodiversity framework. We know the specific actions that they spell out for businesses to take. And as you can see on the slide, there is a lot to leverage from the government side. Governments have started acting. There is a lot to leverage from the business side with frameworks. We still need to work, of course, on standardizing and harmonizing what we worked on. Uh, but the message is very clear, and I'd just like to end by uh, paraphrasing this quote we have on the screen from Alan Jope, the CEO of Unilever, that the message to the private sector is clear, businesses around the world and from all sectors will need to take large scale action now to halt and reverse nature loss by 2030. Um, so I hope on this note, this was um, a good overview and the rest of the section um, will be able to have, you know, provide additional deep dive into what is expected from companies to deliver. Thank you very much for the invitation. And of course, I'll stay on to answer any additional questions needed. Thank you very much, Michael, for your insights on COP15 and the target 15 uh, bus for businesses. So it's very exciting to see that there's a momentum on this topic uh, and a lot of initiatives and also the strong engagement from uh, Business for Nature. And we hope that it will leverage uh, further actions on this topic. Um, so time is actually running fast. We will take, uh, so do not hesitate to ask your questions through Menti. We will have a Q&A time at the end, and we will also try to answer to some questions in the chat during, during uh, the session. Um, and um, a little addings on the target 15. So um, to tell you that the GBS can also support the application of the global biodiversity framework, um, especially target 15, by allowing businesses to report their impact and dependencies on biodiversity, also making recommendations on how to reduce negative impacts, increase positive impacts, and also uh, monitoring the effects of the, these actions. Um, and the GBS can further support the application of the GBF thanks to uh, biodiversity, tra biodiversity trajectories for businesses. And I will let uh, now uh, the floor to Sibyl, uh, our footprint expect expert on this topic. Um, yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. And so, yeah, indeed, we try to interpret the COP15 targets in terms of MSA reduction compared to baseline. And this work is mostly based on scientific papers from the PBL, so the Environmental Agency for the Netherlands. And can you go to the next slide? Yes, so please be aware that those numbers on those slides are provisionary and subject to change. We, yeah, and we also welcome your feedback. So don't hesitate to contact us if you have any. Um, so first thing to know is that this graph uh, focuses solely on one aspect of biodiversity, which is the ecosystem. Uh, it doesn't look at the impact on species or genes, genetic biodiversity. So yeah, uh, here what you see <laughs> how to read this graph. So the, the vertical axis is the remaining biodiversity and the horizontal axis are all the different targets from the CBD or like all the relevant targets from the CBD in terms of ecosystem um, and what, had, what has been uh, evaluated. Um, and the bubbles underneath like the, the circles uh, shows the uncertainty of the evaluation. Um, yeah, so this, the size, the bigger the bubble, the most uncertain is the, the value and the color shows whether it is underestimated or overestimated in red. Um, yes. So first in 2023, we see that we are at 57% of remaining biodiversity. That, that's the first uh, black box or like 
Yeah, that's great. Um, under a business as usual scenario, we would lose between 2023 and 2030 around 2.7% 2 uh, biodiversity. Um, so, yeah. And then we see all those, the different targets uh, after this. So first target one, uh, which is bringing the, uh, bringing the loss of areas of high biodiversity importance close to zero. Um, this could not be evaluated. So here we see zero, but it's probably uh, not zero. <laughs> and therefore there is a high underestimation uh, yeah, on regarding to this target. Then target two is ensuring that by 2030, um, at least 30% of the great areas are under effective restoration. This was evaluated uh, thanks to uh, one of the paper from the PBL. And um, however, this paper, like the action mentions restoration, however, it doesn't really specify any percentage of restoration. So we don't really know whether this um, reduction is overestimated or underestimated. Um, yeah. Then target three concerns protected areas. Uh, this pretty much matches the action from the paper from the PBL, therefore it's rather robust. Um, then target four to six, uh, they concern other pressures or biodiversity aspects that are not evaluated by the GBS. So for example, invasive alien species or genetic biodiversity. So therefore they're not on this graph. Um, then target seven is about reducing pollution risks. Uh, this is probably uh, very likely underestimated. Uh, this action, uh, the, the action that we used uh, in the reference paper, um, only consider actions regarding to uh, pollution by nitrogen and not pesticides or hazardous chemicals, as it was mentioned in the target. So most likely there will be more uh, reduction. Uh, thanks to this target. Uh, then target eight is the target related to climate change. We assumed an alignment with a two degree global warming scenario, but um, the, the target itself doesn't specify any quantitative objective. So it doesn't mention any alignment with the Paris goal. So most likely, most likely we overestimate the reduction provided by this target. Yeah. Then target nine was not assessed because it is mostly related to benefits to people. Um, target 10 is related to uh, sustainable management of agriculture and forestry. Uh, we combine different actions from the different papers to um, uh, to reach this target uh, MSA reduction. Um, and uh, however, the, the target does not really specify which measure should be implemented. So most likely we included measures that should not be included or other way around. So yeah, most likely it, it will be a, a bit lower, a bit less of a reduction. Um, then target 11 to 14, or we didn't consider that they were relevant, so we did not assess them. Um, then for target 15, uh, so the target for companies, you don't see it on this graph because we considered that the reduction of impacts from companies is embedded in the reduction of impacts assessed from target 1 to 10. Um, and so we didn't associate an additional reduction uh, for target 15. And lastly, for target, target 16, it's related to the reduction of the global footprint of consumption. Um, we use different, um, we use the different actions from the, the, the papers from the PBL, so the action dietary change and reduce waste and losses um, to estimate the associated reduction but target 16 doesn't explicitly mention dietary change. So once again, it should, it's most likely overestimated. And so overall, you see that we, with those uh, GBF targets, the global uh, biodiversity um, 
we would uh, we would uh, reduce global biodiversity loss by about four percent. Um, and yeah, but please keep in mind, as I explained earlier, as, as I explained earlier, that those are provisional uh, numbers, and uh, yeah, and also that we only look at the benefits on ecosystem and not species or genes or yeah. I think you can move to the next slide. Yes, uh, here you see the trajectory until 2015. Uh, so once again, the vertical axis still represents the remaining biodiversity, uh, the planetary boundary at the 72%, and split the graph between safe operating space and the orange zone, the danger zone. Um, uh, yeah, and in gray, you see the baseline scenario, SSP2. Um, and in green, that's the trajectory or our estimated trajectory based on our estimate interpretation of the CBD targets. Um, and we see that those targets under our estimations would make it possible to bend the curve. Um, however, we would still not go back to a level of remaining biodiversity that would be compatible with the planetary boundary. Yes. Thank you very much, Sibyl, for this presentation. So um, as a reminder, so it's our first preliminary work on this topic. So we will be very happy to discuss uh, if you have any suggestions. Uh, and you can find our contacts uh, email address at the end of the slides. And also do not hesitate to ask your questions on uh, Mentimeter. Uh, so you will find uh, the link in the, in the, in the Zoom chat. Uh, and we will have some Q&A time uh, at the end of the webinar. And now we will discuss uh, about the biodiversity credits. And we're happy to talk about this with Simon. Uh, Zadek from Nature Finance, and then Elisa uh, from CDC Biodiversity. So now the floor is yours, Simon. Right, thank you. Let me just uh, sort out my slides. Is that working, Patricia? Yeah, fine. Brilliant. Okay, well, thanks very much for the invitation to join. Um, I recall perhaps up to a year ago, um, if you'd asked 100 people in the biodiversity or the carbon, you know, or the finance space, are there going to be biodiversity credit markets, the majority of people would have said no. Um, today, there's a conference on every street corner, uh, it seems it's turned into sort of the fashionable moment. And, and that's an opportunity to do things interesting and impactful, but, but it's also a moment where we need to be careful um, not to do things foolish as we have seen play out elsewhere. So I have a few slides to share with you that I hope will help to organize our thinking a little bit. I'm hoping this works. So um, is this a new business? Um, clearly, it's acknowledged in COP15. Um, the reason for building these financial instruments embedded in new financial markets is effectively to try and internalize biodiversity value that's not getting countered in normal markets for products and services. So that's the same as with carbon in various different ways. Um, uh, and the question is whether it's a smart thing to do. And if so, how might it be a smart thing to do? And so um, we'll try and uh, kind of play this out. So the arguments are already, um, if you like, turning into a lot of noise. You know, should there be offsets? Shouldn't there be offsets? Well, of course, there are offsets already. Should there be secondary trading? Shouldn't there be secondary trading? You know, are we looking for a singular approach um, a particular credit that is similar across multiple jurisdictions and approaches, or are there many different kinds, like a sort of branded credit market as opposed to a commodity credit market? 
you know, do we just want to do local markets, you know, like the Australian National Repair Bill that's going to create the first regulatory, national regulatory framework for biodiversity credit markets, at least at a domestic level in Australia? You know, is it voluntary? Is it mandatory? Or is it some combination of the two? Uh, and if so, in what way? Uh, those of you who've worked on carbon will see some similar questions, but also some distinct questions beginning to emerge. Now on carbon, I'm sure I don't have to tell anybody, you know, uh, it's a mess. Um, and I don't have to repeat what the mess is, but perhaps um, I can offer from Nature Finance uh, a kind of view as to why there's a mess. Uh, and inevitably, uh, people have many different ways of describing it. But, but I would um, uh, posit that it's not really because of bad certification. Um, it's because of bad governance. You know, that there are no examples of voluntary certification markets that can really hold up high integrity markets anywhere at any time, at any point in history. Yeah, and so certification models only work if markets are governed correctly and certification is part of that process. And clearly voluntary carbon markets don't tick that box in any shape or form. Uh, and then we have a sort of a mental model problem, which we go, well, there are carbon markets. Can we get biodiversity credit markets to look a bit like carbon markets? Or is that actually a wrong way of thinking? And what we have to do is go, no, 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 they mustn't be like carbon markets at all. We need to really think quite differently about biodiversity credit markets, not just because credit biodiversity is not carbon and uh, all of the differences that that involves, um, but also because we need to perhaps think a little bit differently about what kinds of markets we actually want to build. And that then brings um, me on to kind of the next piece of the story. So, um, you know, next time somebody asks you or says something about biodiversity credit markets, you should ask them, well, what kind of market are you actually talking about? Forget the credits for a minute. Let's just focus on the market. Yeah. And here we have you know, for us, a sort of a working taxonomy of different things that are being talked about out there as if they're the same thing, but they're not the same thing. So we've got a whole bunch of folks going, you give us $100,000 to invest in a coral reef, we give you a credit, you retire the credit, you have bragging rights, and that's the market. Yeah, well, maybe. Uh, or we already have lots of biodiversity regulated offsets. Yeah, we have them in the EU, we have them in the UK, we have them in Australia and elsewhere, tens of billions of dollars every year already. So anybody who goes, there shouldn't be biodiversity offsets is kind of missing the point. There are biodiversity offsets, but they're not traded as such. So none of them yet have secondary trading markets. They're effectively, you made a hole there, so next door you should plant a tree. And there's loads and loads of that already out there with no secondary trading whatsoever. Uh, and then, of course, you've got insetting, you know, so here's Nestle, let's invest in soil restoration in Ghana, um, and soil restoration in Ghana will improve the productivity of that soil, improve the quality and volume of cocoa produce that um, Nestle can buy from Ghana, uh, and so fits into their overall value chain, and that credit can be securitized into a financial asset. Um, uh, if Nestle wants to. You know, so that's a productivity enhancing approach to thinking about credits. And then you've got obviously the biodiversity linked carbon, which we're beginning to see emerge. We think that isn't turning biodiversity into an offset, but of course it is, because as you begin to get value differentials between with or without high quality biodiversity, you're beginning to price biodiversity as part of an offset. Yeah, and so is that an offset? Isn't that an offset? Clearly, those are going to be in play uh, quite soon. And then we have sort of full-blown biodiversity offset markets with secondary trading. They aren't out there unless you include water. Yeah, and then, of course, the story begins to change, particularly if you look at Australia as well as elsewhere. And then, as I mentioned, most of that, th these are all financial instruments. Uh, and financial markets, but but then you've got a whole pack of stuff happening at the core of the financial market at the same time, which all has to do with various aspects of 
treating biodiversity or more broadly nature as one or more asset classes and how different credit models allow you to securitize um, different aspects of biodiversity onto your balance sheet. Look at the work of the land banking group coming out of Munich, for example, as a case in point. Look at the work of Intrinsic Exchange working with the New York Stock Exchange and now the SEC on nature asset companies. So lots and lots of different ways. And everybody goes credit and assume that they're saying the same thing, but they're not. Yeah. And so it's important that we, irrespective of our opinion as to which one of these is a good idea and which is a bad idea, it, it's really important that one understands they're all in play. Yeah. And so whatever your opinion is, yeah, perhaps it's better that we understand the different market archetypes and begin to tease out how they might work or how they might not work or what the common characteristics might or might not be. So what are we trying to do? Well, Lee White, um, Minister in Gabon, um, and Carlos Manuel, previously Environment Minister of Costa Rica, now the chair of the Global Environment Facility, you know, both basically said this, you know, please don't give us another marginal side game in ecosystem services payments. We've had quarter of a century of one after the other proposal, um, none of which have ever gone to scale. Yeah, and then they go, we need timely scale, otherwise we don't want another idea. We need a fair price, yeah, and I don't have to regale to you what that looks like um, in carbon markets. Um, I'm sure you all know at least the anecdotal data that's around. And, and obviously one needs credible impact, but credible impact on people as well as on nature. So the whole position of local communities, indigenous people, and kind of nature stewards more broadly needs to be integrated, not only into a particular contract, I promise to give them 40% of the revenue, but needs to be embedded in the way the markets work themselves. And there are plenty of experiences in other markets for making that happen. So it's not an unreasonable way of thinking. And so in the paper that we just put out, um, uh, we sort of teased out what we think are at least a sum of the what we would call a sort of governance stack or building blocks that need to be worked through in building markets that work. Yeah, I'm not going to go through each of these in detail. Some of them are self-evident, but I would make a couple of comments only. One is don't get stuck on principles. It's not enough. That's what the uh, integrity market on of, for voluntary carbon markets has done. It's got stuck at the level of principles, and that definitely won't do the job. Don't assume transparency means the same to everybody. We have actually a very low level of transparency in voluntary carbon markets. We could have a much higher level of transparency, not only about the product, not only about the deal, but also about traders themselves. We need to think about the responsibility of traders as a community, much as we would in pharmaceutical markets. And then there are various other pieces that we can come back to uh, in discussion. Let me just see if I can get to the next, I seem to pause this system for some reason. There we go. And, and so, Back to the noise, you know, these were all our friends and probably your friends and some of the folks kind of on the picture may be represented. And I'm sure there are many, many other brands that we could put on this page, uh, including CDC, of course. Um, and, and so there are lots of people in this game now. And on the one hand, that's great because we need lots of smart people. We need resources. We need experimentation. You know, we need all of that. And on the other hand, needless to say, it's a complete mess. Yeah. And so quite quickly, we need to begin to channel into at least some sort of common community fora that allows some of the critical design elements to be really worked on. Uh, and certainly the recent meeting in the One for of the One Forest Summit in Gabon was sort of all about biodiversity credit markets, although they were talking about nature certificates, um, and what kind of platform might be built over this year and into next year 
in trying to build out how they might work at scale, delivering a fair share and having the requisite impact on people and nature. Um, we think there are some critical questions, design questions that need to be addressed. And we've seen from the VCM experience that some of the most critical issues become marginalized, you know, at the altar of getting volume, liquidity, and rapid price discovery. So we need to get the right balance between traditional characteristics of financial markets in particular, uh, and some of the critical architectural characteristics of these markets that we need in order to actually make them operate as they need to in delivering equitable nature positive outcomes. Um, you know, what, what does that mean for us? Um, you know, Nature Finance is one of many organizations. We are very heavily focused on some of the critical governance architecture of these markets across the taxonomy. So not just for one type of market, uh, where most interested in the transparency and accountability piece, yeah, the fair share piece. So what are the mechanisms for embedding that in the way markets work themselves? The nature steward piece, how do we ensure that indigenous people and local communities are not simply creating projects for sale, but have some leverage and governance control over the way in which these markets actually work in practice. Uh, and of course, ultimately, um, how one generates the requisite demand. Many actors saying this is surely entirely a voluntary space, but we've seen that that's unlikely to deliver against timely scale. The question is how one connects voluntary processes to, shall we say, policy-induced demand, which need not necessarily be offset compliance. There are many different ways of policy encouraging timely scale. So with that, um, let me stop. I hope that's useful. Pass back, Patricia, to you and the team. Thank you very much, Simon, for your insights. And also in the um, uh, in the audi audience, it was asked if we can have uh, the link of the report uh, that was just published. So uh, we will send you um, the, the, the link with pleasure. Um, so I will let the floor to Elisa on the, bio on the launch of our biodiversity credits working group. Um, and yeah, thank you very much, um, Patricia. Is it working well? Can you all hear me? Yeah, cool. Um, so yeah, we will uh, first, um, well, put a bit of context on the biodiversity credits working group. As we just heard from Simon, it's a very interesting and uh, emerging topic with a lot of really complex challenges and questions uh, that are, are raised. And well, I will say a bit more on the Before Papers Club just after, but just so you know that historically uh, the Before Papers Club, which is hosted by CDC Biodiversity, has an objective to, uh, well, anticipate and follow up on financial, regulatory and market development with regard to biodiversity printings, but uh, also more. And of course, keep uh, companies and financial institutions that are our members uh, well informed about biodiversity printing and the associated challenges and topics and evolving ecosystem around those topics. So the launch of the biodiversity, biodiversity credit working group that we will um, talk about today really comes in the context of uh, the emergence of this uh, biodiversity credit topic and all the uh, questions that are um, that are around and uh, that are raised with this uh, emerging uh, emerging challenge and all the more in the context of the newly adopted uh, Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, which was introduced by Michael a bit earlier during the webinar, which notably includes Target 19, which um, aims to, well, I quote, uh, substant substantially and progressively increase the level of financial resources from all sources, as we, as we saw before, in an effective, timely, and easable access uh, accessible manner including domestic, international, public, and private resources, and in accordance with Article 20 of the Convention, to implement national biodiversity strategies and action plan by 2030, mobilizing at least 200 billion United States dollars per year, as Michael reminded us. And it notably includes the idea of stimulating innovative schemes, such as payment for ecosystem services, green bonds, biodiversity offset and credits, 
as we are talking about today, and benefiting mechanism with environmental and social safeguards. So to just uh, say some words around the before the prescript so that you know uh, what we are talking about. So next slide, please. It's coming. So the b 4 Plus Club was uh, launched in uh, 2016, and uh, it now gathers more than 50, uh, 50 uh, companies and financial institutions around biodiversity footprinting uh, topics. And the idea of the club, well, it's composed of, um, of different things, but the most important is that it's uh, an ecosystem of stakeholders. So um, it's composed of various working groups, uh, which are meeting twice uh, per year and uh, also during a plenary. And so far, we have been working around three working groups, which are the, uh, on consultancies, on finance, value chain. And we also have some partners that we have been working uh, with. And this year, in 2023, we are launching two new working groups, including uh, one on biodiversity credits and another on, uh, on energy utilities. We won't uh, spend a lot of time on the B4B Plus Club, but just to give you an overview of what is also uh, inside the club, we uh, provide a literature review to our members. It's also composed of, um, of a GBS license, including in the, um, in the uh, membership. And it's really the idea of having an innovative hub around like uh, talking about new topics and trying to, um, to innovate and really reflect on that kind of, uh, of challenges and issues. And to do so, we also propose some case study with our members on a restricted perimeter of their activities and uh, innovative topics such as biodiversity credits, which we really hope to, uh, to do. And we also provide some technical support and priority uh, access to uh, trainings proposed by CDC Biodiversity. So just to dig a bit further on the uh, launch of this uh, biodiversity credits working group, so uh, the idea was really to, um, well, based on, um, on the on the uh, fact that it's a really um, raising topic and uh, increasing a lot of attention with a lot of initiatives emerging as we just saw during uh, Simon's presentation, we really want to uh, help our members um, of this working group understanding the landscape and the methodological question that are at stake. And to do so, we identified some first reflection that the Biodiversity Credits Working Group could focus on uh, during the, the first year of existence, which are, for example, what step can we do after a biodiversity footprint assessment to first verify, but also counterbalance negative impact that we identified during these exercises? How can we also measure biodiversity gains and associate biodiversity credits to, this, uh, to those gains? How do we actually counterbalance negative impact, which is also a big question, and how do we actually progress on technical and conceptual issues to uh, really implement biodiversity credits? And for this um, aspect, so we identified uh, three uh, like work area that we could focus on during the first year of, um, of applications, which are on the next slide. Yeah, so we have three areas of work. Uh, which, uh, well, we have the first one on accuracy. The idea here is to, um, to reflect on how can we properly measure the biodiversity loss and gains and improve the accuracy of uh, a biodiversity measure measurements. We also have um, an area and a focus on verification. So how do we actually verify uh, biodiversity footprint assessment that we are conducting and how we, do we conduct field verification? And an also very important topic, which is on ecological equivalence, which is composed of various aspects. The first one is uh, in terms of location. So what, for example, is the distance recommended, recommended to counterbalance negative impacts occurring in a specific place. Also in terms of temporality, because how do we counterbalance impact that occurred in the past, but today or in the future? And the type also of ecosystem that were impacted by biodiversity loss and that will be impacted by counterbalancing measures. So, well, to tell you a bit more on the audience and content of the, of the working group. So this will be um, an English working group open to all companies, financial institutions, consultancy that are willing to work on these uh, issues and, uh, and participating in the reflection around biodiversity credits. So as for the other working group, we will have um, two working group uh, a year in addition to, uh, to the B4B Plus Club plenary. And we will also have some additional and de dedicated webinars on biodiversity credits. 
And during this uh, event, we'll have some uh, external experts on biodiversity for participating, such as, for example, Vera, who will be participating in, uh, in the first working group. And it will also include, uh, as I was saying uh, at the beginning, uh, a literature review speci specifically dedicated to biodiversity credits and also the possibility to, uh, to carry out uh, a case study. So just, uh, well, if you want to know more on the, on the club, we won't have time today to, uh, to go uh, into further detail, but do not hesitate to, uh, to go and have a look at our specific uh, webinar we organized on the Vicorepus Club. Uh, we will put the link in the uh, in the in the chat, and we, you will also have the link in the in the presentation. Um, I think that now we can move uh, to a quick example of uh, what the work uh, could uh, could be around the biodiversity credits. So here, the idea is really to illustrate the type of outcome that could be uh, well that we will be working on and digging further during the biodiversity credit working group. So this is the very first version of. Uh, mapping of the biodiversity credit stakeholders and, um, and ecosystem. So globally, when we, um, we, uh, we identified several major uh, gathers of stakeholders, and here you have, uh, well, in blue, some uh, on the figure network and uh, knowledge hubs. So for example, the first one that we had identified is a biodiversity credit alliance that you can see on the screen which is composed of uh, the OBC, the Organization for Biodiversity Certificates, and of Plan Vivo, which is a certification body. So just to give you uh, some details on this, uh, on this network. So first, the OBC was launched in, uh, in October last year and is led by uh, Adriana, which is a method developer. So method developers are indicated in, uh, in red in the figures, and Le Printemps des Terres, which is a, a knowledge actor in light blue. In partnership with uh, with various organizations such as Carbon Four and the National Museum of uh, Natural History, and Plan Vivo, uh, which is uh, in uh, in yellow for standard uh, setter and verification body, is a um, certified project uh, against the Plan Vivo standard, which which is a, a framework for a community and smallholder land use and forestry projects. So the idea is that it generates a certificate which represents um, emissions reductions and uh, also uh, represent some uh, co-benefits included uh, biodiversity protections. We also identified uh, other, um, other kind of network and stakeholders. So we have uh, the Nature Framework Development Group, uh, the NFDG, which is in uh, red as it is a method developer. So the objective is that uh, it was formed to uh, develop a natural crediting framework, including an underlying methodology to drive investment to high quality biodiversity conservation and restoration activities across ecosystems and geographies. And it includes various actors which are appearing in the screen. I won't uh, say everything because we, uh, we are running out of time, but you have, for example, Blue Natural Alliance, the Conservation Finance Alliance, the International Union for Conservation of, uh, of Nature, IUCN, the Biodiversity Consultancy, and you also have uh, Vera, um, to focus very quickly on, uh, on this one, uh, Vera is a method developer which uh, has launched the uh, SDVITA uh, Nature Framework Advisory Group to uh, actually guide the development of a framework that will outline the, um, the key components of a scient scientifically robust, pragmatic, and scalable methodology. And this advisory group will also support the development of the biodiversity methodology for assessing and quantifying the benefits from conservation and, uh, and restoration activities. Um, then we have the World Economic Forum, under which, um, um, which is steering a global initiative called Financing for Nature, which we can see uh, on, uh, in blue on the, on the screen, which explores the potential for biodiversity credit market to unlock financial for nature positive outcomes, how we already discussed uh, today. Um, and then we have a very last one uh, on the mapping, which uh, is actually uh, from the Australian government, which is establishing a new uh, voluntary nature repair market to support landholders to restore and protect nature. So the idea of this market is to make it easier for companies and others to invest in a nature repair and to drive biodiversity improvement across uh, Australia. So that was quick, but uh, I see that we are really running out of time. So uh, the idea is also to explore this uh, further during the biodiversity credit working group. So 
as, uh, as you can see, well, the majority of the stakeholders that we identified are both knowledge hub or method developers. And we have also a few, provide, um, few actors that provide certification and few also that actually issue biodiversity credit so far. But as we uh, have seen with the uh, Simon presentation, Otabi, the uh, ecosystem is moving very fast and we are very uh, happy to uh, explore this further during this, uh, this uh, very new working group of the B4B Plus Club. And I will head back uh, toward uh, Patricia to take the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much to all our speakers for this very fruitful session uh, with many insights on the on the on the news around the biodiversity um, and the COP15 outcomes. So now, um, so time actually uh, is really is running out. Uh, we will try to answer to some of your many questions in the chat. Um, and also Joshua Berger, the head of the Biodiversity Footprint Department in CDC Biodiversity, uh, joined us to for this Q&A, um, little Q&A session. Um, so before transitioning to the question, uh, to the question, just a few words um, on um, also a publication that uh, our team at CDC Biodiversity is preparing and which is about to be released. So you will have the descriptions in the slides and it will be published soon our, on our website. So please stay tuned. Um, and you will have the link also to our previous uh, publications uh, on the GBS. So on the Mentimeter, There were, there were a question on wh whether you are interested in joining the B4B Plus uh, Biodiversity Credits Working Group. And um, while you're answering these questions, so there are some, um, some questions, uh, maybe to Simon directly. Uh, so do you believe that a real biodiversity offset is actually possible and can habitat or ecosystem um, to be recreated somewhere else and classify as uh, as an offset? So um, there are tens of billions of dollars of biodiversity offsets already. So it's posed as a hypothetical question, um, but, but what you've just got to do is look at the market. You know. The entire of the European Union, the UK, the US, Colombia, and others have biodiversity offset programs. Um, and it's valued at tens of billions of dollars. And, and, and so I, I think it's a sort of theoretical question. Um, uh, uh, if you ask me, do they work or not? That would be a different question. But, but also, if you ask me, would it be good for those to be internationalized, I think that becomes much more difficult. Then you're comparing, you know, soil in Argentina to soil in northern Kenya to soil in the Black Forest in Germany. You know, that's a much more difficult game to play, exactly as the person asking reflects on. Or, or if you ask me, should there be offset programs but no secondary trading? Yeah, again, I think that's a very valuable conversation to have. I think the jury is absolutely out on that. You know, we can imagine a situation where the equivalent of carbon border adjustment tariffs become relevant in the biodiversity space. And we can imagine it because the EU is already threatening to ban the importation of soya and beef um, related to deforestation in Brazil. Those are not offsets, but they're beginning to create cross-border valuation mechanisms with regulatory aspects to them. So there are offsets, number one. Those offsets remain localized and there are no secondary trading markets associated with offsets. So that's true. Are they likely to happen? Yes. They are likely to happen. Does it bring many problems? Yes. But for us to just go, they shouldn't exist or to turn away from them 
is not the best way for us to shape if and if so how they evolve. Thanks, Simon, for, for your insights on this question. Um, uh, we are sorry we won't have time to, to take orally uh, other questions. So please make sure that you're registered uh, in Eventbrite on this event to, to receive the slides and also some addings on the questions after uh, this webinar. Thank you very much uh, to all the participants and to our invited speakers. Uh, and also speakers uh, at CDC Biodiversity. I hope that you enjoyed the webinar and that it was insightful for you and I wish you a very nice day. Mm -hmm.